Alright, this is a very special video because it's not every day you get to review your own book. Well, it's not my book. Uh, it's more the work of the editors, uh, Roy Scranton and Matt Gallagher, who did, a, who did a wonderful job. I'm very thankful to them. But it has one of my stories. Uh, this is a collection of military short fiction from our uh, recent or current wars, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Uh, it was published last month in February and I received it in the mail a couple weeks ago and, uh, and read through it again. I had read the electronic version. So this is probably going to be an absurdly long video because there's a lot I want to talk about. I made a list to help me keep track. I want to talk about the beliefs about the military and about soldiering that I have very slowly and reluctantly arrived at. I want to talk about soldiers in American culture, uh, hero and victim. I want to talk about how a lot of veterans, myself included, are becoming ANCAPs. Uh, a little bit about maybe the kind of shrill anti-war left. And I want to talk about some of these wonderful stories in this book. Uh, maybe a little bit about my own experiences and my own story and uh, and then about publishing in general because this book has has really put a lot on my mind in that regard with future projects um, alright so the anarcho-capitalist case against war oh and I'm gonna put a ton of links in the uh, down below so uh, so check them out okay so uh, the anarcho-capitalist case against war, you can make it a lot of ways. Uh, I like to, to get people thinking this way. Um, most people have, have two beliefs. Uh, first of all, the belief that uh, a monopoly will cause high prices and low quality. That's the first belief. The second belief people have, when you ask them what is a state, their definition will inevitably either describe or overtly include a monopoly. A state is a monopoly on justice and on security. Certainly there can be other institutions of justice and security, but they exist in pronounced, uh, in pronounced, um, um, uh, they're supervised by the state. A subservience, that's the word I was looking for. Okay, so you believe that monopolies cause High, uh, high prices, low quality, and you believe that the state is a monopoly on security and justice. Should we be so surprised then that the price and the, uh, the quality of security is not what we would like it to be? Uh, that's, that's the case against, uh, against war. It's not the case against security, not the case of a uh, <clears throat> against guns or anything like that, but that's the case against the, the government's military. So what I've come to believe very slowly and reluctantly about soldiers is that their primary purpose is not security. Their primary purpose is propaganda. The soldiers are never presented as them. The soldiers are us. The soldiers are the best of us, the best of our society. Um, this is very important early on in a war where this, the, the image of the soldier and their suffering has to be put up on a pedestal. Like, look what these fine young men who, and women who are the best of us, look what they're sacrificing. You need to at least give up some of your liberty. You need to at least give up some more of your taxes. Uh, we can hardly remember that in the first couple years of the war, of the Iraq war there was this mantra in, in all the headlines that we're sending our troops to war ill-equipped they didn't have the right equipment um, maybe that was true maybe it wasn't um, but it, that mantra that uh, arrived just so universally and so strongly that I suspect military industries may have been behind it though I am a little bit uh, conspiratorial I have gone down the rabbit hole and I'm not coming back. So, soldiers uh, in American culture. 
Oh, uh, a little bit more. Uh, so the soldier's suffering is necessary to get people to accept the war, to get people to give up their liberty and taxes for the war, to get people to support it or at least not oppose it. Um, that's uh, almost uh, almost universal slander against anti-war people is you need to support the troops. That line's gotten a little tired. You don't hear it that much anymore. But but that's that's one of the best known ways to uh, to uh, stop anti-war uh, anti-war movements. And uh, the Nuremberg Diaries were that American psychologist interviewed a bunch of top Nazis. I believe it was in the interview with Goring, or maybe it was Goebbels, that uh, that Goring or Goebbels said um, um, it's very easy to start a war. Just uh, 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 tell people who oppose it that they're putting you in danger, that they're putting society in danger. So even he he acknowledges that tactic. So early on. The soldier's suffering is necessary to establish the war, to get people to support it or at least not oppose it. But as a war drags on, uh, one year, two year, five years, ten years, as a war drags on, the soldier's suffering becomes a burden. The state is increasingly asked to justify its action. Uh, soldiers make YouTube videos. Uh, they they take uh, pictures and those pictures show up in places that are embarrassing to the state. So while I welcome the removal of conventional forces from Iraq, I personally also consider it a switch from conventional forces to more clandestine forces, namely to the types of soldiers that are more conducive to the state's aims, ones that, that can still do the violence but they don't complain we don't make YouTube videos. Uh, w one illustration of how the soldier's uh, main purpose is propaganda is how the soldier is received versus the mercenary. Even if they do the same job, even if their wages are comparable, I know in actuality mercenaries today earn more, but even if, they're sold, if their wages were comparable, you couldn't imagine parades being held in celebration of mercenaries. You couldn't imagine big monuments being built, you know, and people delivering flowers to those monuments and putting little flags or, or whatever in the ground, even though the mercenaries' job and the soldiers are extremely similar. There was one incident in, in Afghanistan on my last deployment, my third and last deployment, where uh, <laughs> uh, some guy in the operations room, some pogue, which is the the disparaging term that combatants use for, or that that uh, that um, trigger pullers, as as another slang, that you know the more combat focused soldiers use to disparage the support soldiers. So some pogue was uh, disparaging how the the guys we were fighting against the Afghan insurgents, how oh they're just doing it for money, and I'm like, <laughs> God damn it, you know how many how many of us you think would be here, you know if we were if our paycheck stopped coming, you know, and then you know it's like interrupting a movie when you make those kind of complaints to to people in uniform, like some people will agree with you, you know some people will just consider it an interruption, and then everyone goes back to watching the movie. So that is what I consider the role of the soldier propaganda. It's a very heterodox position, obviously. But it's reflective in how the soldier is received in American culture. There is the, the common portrayal of the soldier is hero or victim. That's what's sold, that's what's on television, that's what's in the movies. Uh, by and large. Exceptions are few and far between and need lengthy explanations. Um, the, uh, the, and as, as our war reaches the 10-year mark, passes the 10-year mark in Afghanistan, the, the hero narrative is kind of hard to sell because the war is so unpopular. So I think the victim nar narrative is held up much higher. Um, yeah. 
um, like the naive victim, like they went with unrealistic expectations to war, and they saw all this stuff, and now they're traumatized by them. And I'm not saying the trauma isn't real, I'm just saying that that's the image that's accepted, that's easy. It's easy. The images of soldiers that are much harder to accept are the uh, bloodthirsty um, the bloodthirsty adventurer type image or the uh, like the fake victim. Now let's talk about this. Uh, I'm not saying that that the suffering of many service of many soldiers and veterans isn't real. Like the you can't fake the suicide rate. That that's very real. I know people who, who have PTSD, all that's real. But, you know, when the, when the incentives are, are upside down, you know, when there are, are financial and social benefits to being victimized by your experience, I'm sure that some, some people are, are faking it. In fact, I kind of know some people who I think play it up a lot more than they deserve to haven't been outside the wire, whatever else. Uh, uh, the reality is that um, that whatever your faults were before you went to the military, and and we both we all know a lot of people join the military for self-destructive reasons. Whatever the faults a, a guy or girl has, they get out of the military, and very often, very often they have all those same faults. Um, maybe they have additional problems if they've seen some, you know, some traumatic things. And they have an excuse. Because however you behave, it's all very easy to justify uh, with four simple words. I've been to war. Um, Thomas Sowell, who I think is a greatly underappreciated economist, was talking about intellectuals and welfare. Um, and he was he said something about that that I want to apply to the to the victimized soldier about intellectuals and welfare he said intellectuals give people who have the handicap of poverty the further handicap of a sense of victimhood I think the same is true about the victim soldier narrative it gives people who have the handicap of this physical and emotional trauma, the further handicap of a sense of victimhood. And I'm, I'm trying to put this somewhat delicately because I know personal fr from personal friends, just from, you know, from reading uh, that, that in, a lot of, in a lot of cases, you know, the, the trauma and, and the suffering is real. I'm not saying it's not. All right. So, like a lot of veterans, um, I, I became an anarcho-capitalist, but I, I'm starting to prefer Hoppe, Hans Reimann Hoppe's term, which is an advocate of a private law society. Uh, uh, other ones include uh, my good friend uh, Drew Yelm. Uh, we did an interview, a radio interview for Radio Free Market once where we just talked about being veteran libertarians. Adam Kokesh is probably the most famous one. He runs a YouTube uh, a show called uh, Adam vs. the Man. Uh, interestingly, uh, I was in Fallujah probably just two or three months before he was there. Uh, I was there with the 82nd Airborne Division and, uh, and we, we were replaced by the Marines. Uh, I know others. Uh, my, my pal Tim still works as a civilian for the military, uh, even though he's an ANCAP, but I'm not going to say his last name. I don't know if it's, if it's sensitive or not. He says it's not, but I'm going to be cautious anyway. Um, I, think, I think a lot of uh, anarcho-capitalists, just because they start to hate the state so much, and they hate all these stupid, unnecessary, wasteful, destructive wars, they kind of they kind of throw out the uh, the whole institution of warrior culture, which I think is a mistake. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of good things in warrior culture. I think uh, a lot of the things like uh, duty, physical courage, selflessness, all of those have been virtues ever since uh, prehistoric men band together to hunt prey. 
all those all those things have been virtues. It's just now those uh, all those virtues are put in the service of of something that's that's really bad. They they've been co-opted by politicians, but I still think you can find a lot of nobility in in warrior culture. Um. I relate really strongly to the anti-war movement, as you might imagine, but a lot of what you get from the anti-war movement is this kind of shrill, like, it's just so emotional and shrill, and a lot of those, those things that the guys complain about, I just view as horrible uh, discipline problems. They'll talk about massacres, about shooting civilians, and maybe this is just the officer in me speaking, but I'm like, God damn, where were your junior leaders, you know? Like, that that stuff would, n would have never flown in my unit, but I do think I was in a, in a really special unit. Uh, I was in, in the main effort battalion of the 82nd Airborne Division, and I, I'm pretty proud of, of the discipline that we kept. Uh, I know I know for a fact that other units did not. Uh, one of my friends from the 4th ID said that they would, anyone out with a shovel at night, uh, they would shoot on sight at least for a while. Um, I don't know if that was, he said it came from pretty high, I don't know if it was battalion, brigade, division level, but like that kind of stuff never happened, um, at least not during my deployment, which was 2003, 2004, stuff got a whole lot crazier in 2005-2006. Um, I also think that for us ANCAPs, our, the Austrian economic knowledge of uh, time preference uh, helps us understand these massacres in a, in a different way. You no longer have to say that the army turned me into a monster. I mean, it's, it's kind of true judging that, judging a lot of those things from, from the perspective of civilized society, but you just you can also understand that just in terms of soldiers have really low time preference you know especially soldiers who've been in combat especially soldiers who've seen uh, their buddies uh, uh, hurt or killed they have really really low time preference you know and it, a lot makes sense once you apply that idea why so many soldiers uh, smoke or drink or start smoking and drinking even if they hadn't before uh, why they, after soldiers return home, they engage in reckless thrills because their, their time preference hasn't, oh, I said really low time preference. What I meant is uh, soldiers have really short or very high time preference, meaning they want gratification now instead of later. Um, you know, if there's a, a kid in the gun turret, he's always making the decision, should I take the risk and not shoot these people and then have a better relationship with the local populace or should I shoot them you know maybe that'll create problems in the future but I'm gonna live to see tomorrow and and that that just puts military occupation under so much so much pressure so I had that idea I wanted to share but uh, um, let's get to the book um, most of the stories in here are stories about home. Um, perhaps you can say all stories about war are stories also about home because, you know, you need some... Home gives you the basis of kind of understanding and, and seeing war. It's the place you came from. Um, but, but most of these stories are about soldiers who've returned and are having a hard time adjusting. Um, one of my favorite war stories of all time is also about that uh, J.D. Salinger's A Perfect Day for a Banana Fish. You should check it out. Um, also, one of the first uh, short stories I've ever published was on this theme. Uh, I think it was called Something Worth Fighting For. And uh, I, wonder if it's, I wonder if it's still up online. I'll, I'll, I'll link to it if it is. Um, So, uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the stories in here was written by a uh, military spouse, uh, Sibhan Fallon. When Colin got back from his 
first tour four years ago as opposed to second or third he came home to a wife in a thong and high heels frying up pork chops and that was all the healing he needed now the worrying doesn't end when the deployment does I'm uh, happy to say that I can relate to that scene so uh, this story by Fallon which is called tips for a, a smooth transition um, it kind of takes excerpts from a military uh, publication about how to how to adjust to the return of your soldier and I've always been impressed of how good the military was at articulating its problems not always at solving them but it's always good at articulating them except of course the big problem of central planning in the provision of security but uh you know, he, so the story is interlaced with excerpts from that publication. Be aware that many soldiers return home with a feeling of post-combat invincibility. One consequence of combat exposure may be an increased propensity for risk-taking and unsafe behavior. Really accurate. What else do I got here? Oh. <clears throat> Philip Clay's story, Redeployment. Um, now, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my experiences because most people are are curious. Um, like, uh, I, I never saw any big sustained fighting, uh, even though we went looking for it quite often. But it was all like hit and run stuff um, on all three of my deployments. Um, so certainly a lot of people a lot of people saw less than me, but a lot seen a whole lot more. I never felt traumatized by my experiences, but I, like like pretty much my whole battalion, when we came back from any one of our deployments, like, like you, you get this alertness. You're just so used to always being alert. Like you hear just a little car backfiring or a door slamming or just a, a, a sound and like, boom, you get this, you get this alertness. Um, I hear that if you've been more traumatized, it's uh, fear, and even more is panic. But for us, this was almost universal in the whole battalion. It was just this alertness. And contrary to what you might expect, I kind of liked it. It was kind of fun. It was just this kind of echo from this primordial uh, lizard brain, you know, back when, back when, uh, you know, when when we lived in a world of predator and prey. Um, I'm reading, I'm rereading Hoppe's The Great Fiction, and he he cites some archaeological evidence that say says uh, in Neolithic times up to one third of men, uh, one third of men died violent deaths. So, so we're humans are pretty well suited towards. Uh, towards dealing with violence and dealing with this kind of trauma and moving into and out of it. Granted, in Neolithic times, it didn't occur on the scale that it does today. And again, I'm not saying that a lot of people don't have, don't struggle with their experiences, but a lot of them don't. Well, there's a lot of people who don't struggle with their experiences. Theirs is a story that never gets told. You know, you rarely hear about how soldiers towards the end of a deployment start volunteering for combat missions um, you know you never hear about guys who go back because they enjoyed it you rarely hear about them there's one story in here that references that and I'll get to it but anyway I've gone on a tangent um, in Philip Clay's story this is this is probably the best description of that of that alertness that that I've ever read um, in Wilmington you don't have a squad you don't have a battle buddy you don't even have a weapon. You startle ten times checking for it and it's not there. You're safe, so your alertness should be at white, but it's not. Instead, you're stuck in an American Eagle Outfitters. Your wife gives you some clothes to try on and you walk into the tiny dressing room. You close the door and you don't want to open it again. Outside, there's people walking around by the window like it's no big deal by the window like it's no big deal. People who have no idea where Fallujah is, where three members of your platoon died. People who've spent their whole lives at white. 
they'll never get even close to orange. You can't until they, the first time you're in a firefight or the first time an IED goes off that you missed and you realize that everybody's life, everybody's life depends on you not fucking up and you depend on them. Some guys go straight to red. They stay like that for a while and then they crash. They go down past white, down to whatever is lower. I don't fucking care if I die. Most everybody else stays orange all the time. Here's what orange is. You don't see you or hear like you used to. Your brain chemistry changes. You take in every piece of the environment, everything. I could spot a dime in the street 20 yards away. I had antenna out that stretched down the block. I had antenna out that stretched down the block. It's hard to even remember exactly what that felt like. I think you take in too much information to store, so you just forget. Free up brain space to take in everything about the next moment that might keep you alive. And then you forget that moment and focus on the next, and the next, and the next, for seven months. So that's orange. And then you go shopping in Wilmington unarmed, and you think you can get back down to white? It'll be a long fucking time before you get down to white. By the end of it, I was amped up. Cheryl didn't let me drive home. I would have gone 100 miles per hour. That's uh, Philip Clay's story of redeployment. So, <clears throat> lately in my personal life, I'm making a, I've become an entrepreneur of sorts and just having having become obsessed with uh, economics as a lot of libertarians are um, I'm very uh, very cognizant of what what what's his name um, uh, wrote to serfdom what F.A. Hayek called the coercive economy versus the voluntary economy so I noticed right away when two of the stories in here had soldiers who've made the transition from the coercive economy, meaning they get paid by taxes which are collected coercively, to the voluntary economy, whereas they have to please directly or indirectly voluntary customers. Uh, in Colby Bazell's story, Play the Game, the character he portrays uh, <laughs> is a really crappy worker, and I can understand it because, you know, after doing something that has so much gravity, so much life and death. Um, you know, you get this job holding a sign to get people to go to a store and he's, <laughs> the character in this story is uh, really condescending towards that, that work. However, the character in Andrew Slater's story, New Me, he's a stud. I would love to have someone like this working for me. His concern <laughs> is not that the job has no meaning, uh, I think it's this paragraph, so I'll read it out loud. After the first few weeks, it became apparent that there was not much greeting for me to do. Uh, it's a guy who works as a greeter at some truck store or, or a farm supply store. I spent half of the day, half of the work day at doctor's appointments, so I asked what the previous store greeter did with his time. Gerald admitted that I was the first greeter they had hired. He could see I was uncomfortable with the lack of work, so I started to make delivery runs with a young guy named Raymond down in the store to the county mall. Uh, it was only a small inventory, tools and outdoor gear, but customers would place orders for larger items and we would move the orders from our warehouse down to the mall before it opened. Oh, and there was, he kind of got this job because uh, the employer wanted to support the troops and there's a, a later part where he's bored, so he just, uh, he just starts reading about the equipment that he's selling and trying to learn. I kept the store catalog in front of me and studied it when no one was talking to me, which was just about all the time. <laughs> and I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, Andrew Slater, who is a Special Forces soldier, uh, <laughs> uh, writes about a character who just like so diligent and hardworking um, that's what I that's what I got from the SF types that I used to work with, or my friends who went in that direction. 
Oh, by the way, Andrew Slater recently gave a great interview. I think it was on NPR, and, and I'll link to it if you want to get a sense of what life is like today in Iraq. Uh, listen to that interview. Um, he, he returned there to teach as an English to teach English up in uh, in the Kurd region in northern Iraq and I hope he writes about that because that sounds pretty doggone interesting alright let's keep going I'm not I'm not gonna talk about every one of the stories but <clears throat> my favorite story in here is one of three that has uh, a well-developed Arab characters um, and my favorite one is called One of the Three is Mine. Another one is this one, which is my favorite story by Ted Janus. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, most of the stories uh, tell that, tell the, you know, soldier as victim point of view. Soldier returns is having a hard time as adjusting. As I said, it's like J.D. Salinger, Perfect Day for a Banana Fish. Great story. One of my first stories was about that. However, for reasons I cited earlier, that's just that's not the image that I'm I'm most interested. I'm more I'm more interested in the image of soldiers that more like that run against the grain a little bit more. So I like this soldier this uh, story because people were tough as I remember them to be, and they were strong. Um, there, there's huge co cognitive dissonance. dissonance uh, for people who are in tough units because the whole time it's be strong be strong be strong ignore pain you know don't show pain if you have it or, or ignore it embrace it um, and then you get home and like I said there's both financial and social benefits to to being crippled to being traumatized huge cognitive dissonance anyway I like I like uh, Ted Janice's story raid um, oh, and it's it says in the bio that it's his uh, debut. This is the first thing he ever published. I, I hope he writes more. Um, so he was in Ranger Regiment, which is pretty high up on the food chain. And uh, <laughs> here's a conversation that that one of the Rangers has with his Afghan interpreter. How's my favorite Afghan? I asked. Ready to go murder some of your countrymen or what? You know, really insulting, you know, but this is like how people talk when they have that really high time preference. Of course, the, the Afghan uh, translator, he's not victimized by this at all. He comes back, that's funny, Doc. You know, Afghanistan's not really a country, right? It's just a hole where other countries send their retards to die. <laughs> And, and Doc replies, whatever you gotta tell, whatever you tell yourself to get to sleep, Rockstar. And I thought this observation was really true. It, it comes in a bit of dialogue. You gotta understand, Omar, in our country, no one ever thinks about death. It's completely removed from our lives. At worst, it only registers as a slight speed bump before an even more perfect afterlife. But then we come over here and it's in our faces. Over here, death is life. So you see these big motherfuckers like Sergeant Deck coming over seven, eight, nine times. You better believe they dig it. They love it. They worship it. Those are the kinds of people that you don't hear written about very often. And what he said about death being more, I, you know, reading that again, I wasn't even sure if it was his intention, but, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, uh, like, people are just a lot more used to seeing people killed and stuff. Um, Andrew Slater, in his interview on NPR, he says that in, in Kurdistan, and this might, this might hurt the ego of our uh, neocon chicken hawks, but in, in, Kur in the Kurdish region of, of Iraq, um, our, our invasion isn't the most important event of their lives. They remember much more strongly the oppression under Saddam. That, that was a, a much bigger crime, you know? Um, and just like in, in Afghanistan, like 
there's always people getting killed and, and people die at home instead of in hospitals. Um, in, in Iraq, I guess, I, I want to say this in terms of my unit having good discipline in terms of handling civilian casualties, but like in Iraq we killed a number of farmers, I think it was around 12, but in most of them they were farmers that came out onto their porch or outside their little house and they just shot their AKs towards our soldiers and the soldiers did what they were trained to do and kill them. Because in Iraq, that's what you do, or that's what you did prior to the invasion. You know your, uh, your videos are getting too long when you run out of space on the SD card. Um, Alright, so I was saying that this, uh, this passage in Ted Janus' story uh, talks about how, uh, how death is, is much more a part of life for, for Afghans than it is for us. Although he says it mostly in terms of the war going on, but I think it's true in general. And one example that I remember uh, from Iraq is that, that it was a problem um, with like, you know, our soldiers being out on a mission and some farmer would come out of his house with his AK-47 and just spray towards the bushes because he heard a noise there. The thing to do in Iraq prior to the invasion apparently when you heard a prowler or a suspected problem is just to go out and start shooting. So, you know, the, these were much more violent societies than, than we're used to. And uh, here, like, like, the West seems very sterile, you know sick and dead people that's something for the hospital that's not something from the, for the home so I, I like his illusion of that he also just talks about the excitement like part of part of being a soldier in a in an elite unit is just like it's just feeling like a superhero tightly packed in on the floor of the Chinook we looked at each other energy passing from man to man this moment was our one release together. I got the togetherness here. Uh, that's typical ranger humor. Uh, once we got back, things changed. But here I got it, the mission. The only chance to leave the bullshit behind. Without women or alcohol, without cars or drugs, we had only this. He talks about once they set up their perimeter, a lasers danced on the walls of the compound coming to rest on the doorways and windows. I remember something like that. It was almost easier to do missions at night because, because of all the lasers. That was in 2002 when I went to Afghanistan in 2003-2004. Uh, eventually conventional forces, even the, the 82nd Airborne Division, which is a which I think is the best conventional force the army has uh, stopped doing, from what I understand, stopped doing these types of missions that he describes just because there was too many discipline problems. But, but early in the war I, I was doing these types of missions. Oh, here's another example of a <laughs> so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a spoiler here. The in the story, there's a, a ranger named Doc, and his buddy gets killed on this mission. And then the interpreter says, "They're still there. They're still out there on the mission." Uh, <laughs> you know, like the like it, this just happened, and the interpreter, um, <laughs> and uh, and and Doc just tells the interpreter that his buddy died. And he says, all right, Doc, he was a ranger. And then Omar stands up. But you know what's funny, though? <laughs> I looked up at him thinking what it would feel like to have his neck clenched in my hands. And then he says, what's funny? And the, the translator says, this place was a dry hole. We're going to need to come back and do this mission again. And, and in his story, Raid, you, you just get a sense of like this stop and go. Like they're just sitting and they're smart. I, I'm really curious if soldiers in these type of units aren't just like, I'd be really curious what an IQ test looked like. Um, I, I think they're higher in, uh, in the Rangers and, and even maybe in the 82nd Airborne Division because that's a self-selecting unit too, meaning uh, soldiers at least need to volunteer to jump out of airplanes and in the Rangers they need to 
volunteer for that and a whole bunch of really tough training. It's a really tough vetting process. But anyway, the, the stop and go feeling uh, I really re kind of remembered where you're just sitting and having like sometimes really clever, smart, funny conversations, but like just this feeling of relax and all of a sudden like boom, helicopters are here, time to go, like go, 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 and then just stop and, and that, that woody banter. So I love that story. Oh, uh, I was going to say, um, I, I was going to say uh, in Iraq prior to the war, the thing to do when you heard a prowler was just spray your gun. Um, and we had a problem because, you know, these farmers would just go out thinking that they're shooting at prowlers and our soldiers would react the way they were changed and they would kill the farmers. And uh, I guess this is kind of a, a, a just brutal to to describe this as as a good as something that I'm proud of but I'm I'm proud of how my battalion we always kept contact with the families and did what little we could bought them some goats paid for the funeral uh whatever whatever we thought was appropriate um and I I know a lot of other units didn't didn't go that far but but whenever we had those types of uh, unfortunate incidents uh we did that and and for some reason I was really good at establishing rapport with the locals. Um, I learned quite a bit of Arabic. Um, I, I would listen to I would listen to a, a recording of an Arabic listen, lesson while working out in the gym and I, I got pretty good and, uh, and I just had such good rapport. I'm not sure why but I was like freaky good at just interacting with the locals um, and so it, it became my job, like whenever there, there was this incident, this type of incident, um, not in the whole battalion, but in my company, like I would be the one handling it. I would be meeting, meeting the spouse of some civilian that was killed or, or you know, families or whatever. It was freaking horrible. I hated the job, but I was really good at it. And my, my story is about such an incident, my story called television. right here and the only other thing I'll say about my story this is almost this is true for almost everything I've published no matter how many times I proofread it no matter how many opportunities editors and like the wonderful Roy Scranton and Matt Gallagher who also have stories in here um, no matter how, how, many, how many chances they give me I still find typos after it goes to print nothing like grammatically wrong but little an apostrophe that changes the meaning of a word is in, it's in the wrong place from plural to singular. I just can't do it right. And of course a bunch of stylistic edits. I actually made them there with pen. But I mean there's no end to those. No matter how many times you keep rereading your work there will always be little things you want to change. Yeah, so, so check it out. Uh, if you're curious Fire and Forget. The title of this collection is a is a reference to the uh, to the javelin missile which replaced the dragon. They're both shoulder fired anti tank missiles, but the uh, dragon was wire guided, so so it actually lets out a kilometers long spool of wire, and the the soldier shooting it has to stay there for a few seconds and steer the missile towards the tank, where the javelin missile uh, sees the tank and you fire it and then you run because that's when it's dangerous because when you shoot it you let out a big signature so you just shoot and run and the missile is going to see the tank and continue seeing it through its whole flight so it's that's where the phrase fire and forget comes from and I think it's a good uh, metaphor for this collection and, and these wars because they are kind of forgotten that they, they uh, they're not like the focus of society as Vietnam seems to have been or or World War One or Two, and that's understandable. Those wars had drafts. Um, so publishing. So I'm working on other stuff. Uh, I'm writing a, a a memoir about my third tour to Afghanistan in uh, 2008. Um, my my second to Afghanistan, third overall. And uh, and I'm working on a little science fiction book, which is a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, I've been listening to a lot of Jeffrey Tucker, 
laissez-faire books, self-publishing, down with the gatekeepers, I'm all about that. But man, um, the uh, the publicist at the Capo Press, like she was, she, I, I don't know what, maybe it was her, maybe it was luck, maybe it was these great writers, maybe it was all that together, that's probably what it was, but uh, but this book has just generated so much publicity. On, on their Facebook page, almost every day there's a new review of this book. Um, yeah, there were little events all over the place where the authors were reading par parts of their stories. So, I don't, for, for writers, uh, you know, if you have comments, I'm, I'm curious to hear them. But, but for the writers, the choice is not clear at all. You know, I know other writers, they got thirty, forty thousand dollar advances. These are first time novelists. So the benefits of going to a publicist are very real. You know, you you do get something in exchange for giving up your rights to the book. So it's kind of something I've been thinking a lot about. Wow, that was a pretty long video. Uh if you've reached this point, you're awesome. <laughs> Uh, stay tuned. Uh, there'll be a next one, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, Albert J. Knox, uh, Memoirs of a Superfluous Man. Good night.